So, today we're going to be taking a look at the Wavetech Stabilock 4015, sometimes made by Schlumberger in Germany. Uh, this is what's known as a communications monitor, as you might be able to tell from the labeling on the front. Um, this is a device I picked up a um, year and a half ago. Uh, it was broken and it was on an auction and you know how it is, you put in the lowest possible bid, way a week and oh my, we gotta get this thing shipped. Uh, so I bought it from a seller in the Czech Republic um, who was actually nice enough to arrange for delivery of this thing uh, because I hadn't talked to him before placing a bid. I uh, figured he'd either sort it out or give me my money back. So. Um, yeah, this um, this is a device used for uh, primarily testing uh, narrow band radios like um, ham radios, typically like this thing, or uh, mobile radios, uh, potentially aeronautical radios. It will do AM. Uh, it has a frequency range of something like um, 0.4 megahertz. Uh, up to around just under gigahertz. Um, this model also has the duplex option so it can uh, generate, can act both as a signal generator and as a test receiver and it has some audio analysis, a basic low frequency scope, some voltmeters and various modulation generators. So I think what we'll start with here is I'll walk you through the I.O. functions on the front panel and uh, later we'll uh, get to the rear panel and um, and uh, look at some of the boards and I'll also do um, do a quick uh, demonstration with uh, one of my ham radios just to give you an idea of how this thing normally works. Uh, so uh, you have some ports here these are labeled TX Sense and RX High and you can switch which one's active with this button here, it's multifunction. Uh, depending on the state, you can see the green here, green LEDs mean that it's the relevant function is active in receive mode. So receive here is, is uh, green and that is test receiver mode essentially. Uh, no, hold on, that means it's a signal generator. Uh, the terminology is perhaps a bit confusing because RX in this case means you test a receiver using it. So in this case you can see on the insert here it's set to a frequency in the ham radio allocation and uh, it's set now to use this port here as the output and it's set to produce 11.5 dBm which is quite a lot. If you go down here it's set to minus 100 dBm and uh, this will go down to like minus 130 or something mm -hmm. Yeah, I think 130 is the lower range, which is quite good. And so and this goes up to minus 60 and then this one goes up to plus 13. So you have quite a wide dynamic range available. Um, you can set the frequency that you want to generate. Uh, you can just key it in. Um, you can also choose units, like you can define um, channel numbers in the menus if you want. Um, you have a number of generators that can be used. Uh, in this case that in signal generator mode and that means that these will modulate the output that's here in this case. So right now there's a one kilohertz fixed generator that can be switched to be an external input analog with variable sensitivity. That's one kilohertz tone with two kilohertz peak deviation. You can also turn that off. You can have all three active if you want. This one is variable frequency and variable uh, deviation. And then you have this data one, which is an option card. It's built in there. And that uh, is very useful. You typically use one generator to generate a subtone signal uh, for testing uh, modern receivers with tone squelch. So you can configure this how you want. Um, 
There's some hotkeys up here, but you can you can do most of the the stuff you want to do with the um, with the keypad and this encoder here. There's also a plus minus one, which doesn't really do much, frankly. Um, other keys on here. You see, I have a couple of meters here. These will indicate. Uh, right now, they're configured to measure the output from the voltmeter port here, which you can connect a scope probe to or um, or connect directly to the speaker output or discriminator output from your radio that's under test. Uh, so you can set the voltmeter. You can't use DMOD, DMOD because that's the test receiver function, but you can set it to be the RX mod, in which case you get the audio that's being generated. So. I know this is quite annoying, but say you do 2 kilohertz, so on. There's a volume control here for the internal speaker. Um, it's an extremely useful thing to have, actually. Just you can hook a scope probe up here, and um, you can use it as basically a probe speaker. It's extremely useful. You wouldn't think so, but it is. So. Right now it's showing, you can show you sign ads when it's generating one kilohertz, it can compute the distortion. You can also do distortion and um, you have your volt, RMS voltmeter. Uh, you can get a decibel relative measurements. Uh, go into the menus here, you can choose your units, your impedances for measurement, your um, bandwidth uh, for the FM discriminator has switchable filters, FM face mod or AM, and this is the function select for the external mod input here. Uh, so you can set it to external, you can even do DC FM, which is a strange thing to do, but you can do it. Uh, you have a hardware seek it filter, which is basically a uh, audio telephone bandwidth type filter, which is sometimes useful. You have a C weighting filter um, and high pass, low pass, and pass, band stop. Uh, everything here but the C-Kit will disable your um, distortion measurement. And the reason for that is that that has to be done in the CPU while the C-Kit filter here is in hardware. Uh, further along you have some printers. You can configure a port on the back to be like auto transmit receive switching and stuff. You can find duplex channels and edit a channel list. And there's also a self calibrate and self check. That's about it for the menus. Uh, you'll also notice that the output here can, um, when this modulation generator is active, you can see what the modulation is on that output there. Uh, when the D mod is active, you can also get the D mod output to your scope on this port here. And there's a headphone jack. Um, this main RF. Um, I.O. here can handle 50 watt continuous with 150 watt max and there's a temperature sensor built in so it'll warn you on the display if uh, if there's an issue or if, it, if you're uh, overheating it. There's also fuses in here, these can go bad, I've had corrosion issues on these but I was able to clean it with ISO. Right, let's look at the transmit tester, this um, turns it into a measurement receiver and um, in this case you have a power reading you can use this port or this port but this is obviously limited to 100 milliwatts but it's more sensitive um, this one is intended for testing transmitters above say 100 milliwatts and uh, it has a nice feature where it will auto detect the frequency for you you can actually turn that off somewhere in here auto frequency adjust in this case you have the same here, you can actually uh, range hold the uh, and select a bit of the AF changes here. You can choose your units, your pre-attenuation, pre-attenuation. I think this is if you have a attenuator in series with say this input here, you can add that in there and it'll tell you the actual power before attenuating. Same as on a spectrum analyzer. Same thing with the uh, modulation parameters and filters, they apply to the audio in this case. You see now the D mod output is here, and that's also what's on the speaker. And right now it's just uh, receiving noise because there's no input. Um, you, in this case, you can change the bandwidth here, and that actually changes the FM discriminator 
bandwidth. Um, now in this case, the, um, let's see, the generator is active. If you wanted to, um, generator is active as an output, you can see this is red. And you can also see that the, this port is active because it's red, so this is for connecting a transmitter too. What this means is that you now have the generators here will show in millivolts. I believe you can change the units there as well if you wanted to. You can sometimes want uh, dBm or volt. Uh, same thing, just to show that off real quick. See so here you can go in and say you want dB microvolts or microvolts for example. Sometimes um, adjustment specs will call for that and you can just enter that straight into the unit. You don't have to, uh, to convert it. Uh, but yeah, now these are in millivolts RMS and they're output here. So this is where you plug the microphone input or line input to your transmitter instead. Um, I think we'll, there's some special features here, but we kind of need a radio connected to actually use those effectively. Uh, so I'll show those later. Uh, there's also duplex here. Uh, in this case, you have some dual functions here. So right now, for example, there's a receiver and a transmitter that can be tuned independently. And uh, both of those are connected to this port here. Uh, the um, receiver portion is connected through a large attenuator in that case to prevent catastrophic overload. But you can also say, for example, that you want your receiver, you want to output a signal from here and then put your transmitter in here. Um, or you can go the other way and connect your receiver to this port to get the low signal level this can output while connecting your transmitter to say an attenuator um, and this input. Or use both. Uh, so you have all the options here. Uh, you can also choose in this case wherever you want whatever you want on this port and whatever you want as your um, audio source, you can choose that. Generators can either go to the um, receiver tester or the mod, mod generator or to this port here to connect to a transmitter. Um, and you can choose these independently as well. So you have a lot of flexibility for testing duplex systems like this. Uh, which so it's really a very flexible design and take a look in the special menu here you can uh, you can measure like desensing in a duplex repeater system if, if you plug this after your cavity filter you can uh, check the sensitivity of the receiver uh, with and without the transmitter enabled to get an idea of what the um, um, how much crosstalk you have and how it's affecting your receiver in a duplex setup uh, system as well. The system you kind of need duplex but here you can check for example a five tone uh, system uh, or a subtone system you can make a call in this case you can call that number and then see if the radio responds and how long it takes and all that. I'll show that off later in half duplex mode. Um, I should also mention the display here is flickering a bit. It's not really flickery. It's, I think it's running at 60 hertz. Uh, it's an electroluminescent display uh, made by Finlux. And uh, it's, um, uh, in terms of real life, it's somewhere between the overhead shot, overview shot and the uh, head-on shot in terms of brightness. Um, it's perfectly usable and uh, these are, uh, monochrome orange displays as you can see um, good contrast but uh, I think it's 320 by 200 or 240 resolution uh, but it, it's pretty good actually it's a, it's a lovely display uh, especially if you're not in a very brightly lit room it looks brilliant because it has very high contrast and unlike a CRT the actual display is only about that thick Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a, um, the T70 I showed off earlier and just plug that in using some jig cables. That's 
That's one thing you're going to be doing a lot if you have a tester like this, making jig cables to connect various radios that you want to adjust. Uh, so I'll be right back once that's set up. Okay, I've got the Icon T70 hooked up here. It's at 145.4, same as the signal generator. You're using the high power port, which is what you normally do. And uh, I have this lovely laced special cable, which also has the adjustment resistor jig built in. Uh, so that's a common cable I use for adjusting ICOM handhelds. Um, now, the, there's nothing, we're not getting anything out of it. You can turn the volume all the way up. We're, we've got the audio tap from the voltmeter here, which is the speaker output. Um, but this radio has a tone squelch active. So to find out what that is, we're going to go here to the transmitter tester and we're just going to try keying it. I'm just keying it off screen because I have to hold it in my hand. But in here we do have a signal. Let's turn off the generator here. Ah, you can see there. Let's see here. Bolts. No, bolts. Yeah. You can see right there. It's transmitting something. Now we can actually do one better. We go not to special, but to system. Now it's in five tone mode. Change that to PL mode. Aha. Let's decode. And yep. It tells us, I've already done this obviously, but it tells us that it's um, generating a subtone at 110.9. If I hit the send button, that will switch it to PL mode, but that doesn't really matter. Um, you can also just so you turn it off, it's not in PL mode. But, what you can see now, if I go to one kilohertz, nothing, turn that on, and there's our signal. Now you'll notice the distortion is uh, moderately high in this case, and that I believe is because we're sending a two kilohertz deviation. I think you're supposed to check at 1.5. Oh, actually it's because we're barely giving it a signal. There. Yet sine add better than 30 decibels. And this is now the receiver that's active. So if we go into special, we can find out Hold on, stop that, turn on data. Now it automatically looks for the input level that gives 14 decibels sign at, which is kind of cool. And there we go, minus 126.6. You can also check stuff like, ah, it. I'm gonna turn off this uh, tone squelch here, it's annoying. There we go. We're now measuring the audio frequency response of the receiver. And we can at the same time measure the squelch level and squelch hysteresis. And it's all doing this on its own. It's very useful because this stuff can be tedious. See there we have a small amount of squelch hysteresis. Now in transmit testing, I'm not going to show too much of that because my camera is running out of batteries right now, but um, I can key it manually here. You can see it's in low power, it's producing 685 milliwatts, 1 kilohertz deviation for 8 millivolts RMS signal. I'm going to say 100 millivolts, you can see that it's producing 2.12 kilohertz, so this thing is not uh, perhaps perfectly adjusted for a narrow deviation like it uh, should be. And you can see there the frequency changes when we um, when I key it and um, that's actually a measured frequency that's up here right now. Uh, and so you can see this radio's got a TCXO built in 
So the frequency accuracy is actually quite good, uh, which is uh, which is nice. Uh, now, I am going to get a um, five tone radio hooked up. Uh, I'll have to change some cables around, uh, but I'm just going to demonstrate the five tone decoder for you. Okay, um, I'm now hooked up with a radio that will transmit five tones. This is an ASCOM SC140. Uh, I was going to use an H16T, but uh, that's at the other end of the room. So this one was literally clipped to my pants. Uh, this is a UHF radio, so we're going to transmit here and check what the frequency is for 33.55. Now, what's annoying is it doesn't seem to want to remember that, but just do that. So you can see this one's outputting 2.7 watts, and uh, if I talk into it, you'll see that there is some something happening there. I can turn on the scope, and there we go. So uh, time base is a little narrow, but it does react when I talk into it. Uh, if we go back, the scope has like auto set and audio frequency range, but um, pretty good uh, dynamic range actually. This one is also outputting a 110.9 subtone, but that doesn't really matter. Let's go into system here. Uh, I don't have J cables hooked up, so we can't do any AF level testing in this case. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna set it to sequential mode. And let's see here, we're gonna set it to decode only. And I'm just gonna hit just do that. There we go. And that is five tone decoding. I have a second call key here. Okay, that. This should end with double zeros. Yeah. These are just somewhat randomly chosen um, combos uh, because eight is 1750, which opens a lot of repeaters even today. Uh, the ones that don't have uh, subtones. So we can do some other stuff here. This could obviously call and then measure response time, uh, but that radio does not have a five-tone decoder active right now. And you can pull up a sequential results menu, uh, which is kind of cool, and this will show you the actual frequency you're outputting. It's actually 1745, and it's for 900 milliseconds, which is a bit odd because I thought it was supposed to be eight times, not nine times the uh, standard duration. So that's a little, little weird. Uh, and it's got a hundred millisecond tone durations, which is standard. And um, you see it, in this case, it sent 8570E, and E is a repeat code, which means repeat the last digits. Uh, that has to be, that's so you don't have two tones right after each other. Uh, then it would be very difficult to frame them, obviously. And there's about one millisecond uh, response or pause between each uh, tone in sequence. Um, that's really what you can you can do here. You can obviously change your standard and stuff, and you can also do DTMF. But I don't have a DTMF radio um, ready for hookup right now. But it basically works the same way except it won't do frequency analysis. I think it will do timing analysis on DTMF systems. And all of that decoding and stuff and that, that uh, data generator you were seeing is actually running on a separate board with its own processor that uh, for system testing of say mobile phones would actually be programmed up separately. To um, just turn that off. Um, that that could be do that could be used for say testing an amps mobile phone system or um, NMT four fifty and uh, various other things you might have say a um, I think you could probably do something like MBC twelve hundred like that uh, Roger burst of data at the end of typical Hollywood police radio broadcasts you can, I think you could decode something like that possibly I'm not sure. If, it's advanced enough to do that kind of high-speed data. Uh, 
but yeah, this uh, this device has actually been very useful both for testing radios, which is what it's meant to do, but also as a um, an analyzer and signal generator. Say for um, when you're building your own FM discriminator, you can just say feed in twenty one point twenty one point four megahertz, or well, go to receive mode, but twenty one point four meg at some power level and you can hook up your discriminator output to this port here and uh, maybe activate the secret filter to uh, if you don't have filtering you can turn that on you get your distortion you get your sensitivity you can check frequency response special menu here has obviously scrolls frequency response uh, if bandwidth checking which is kind of an oddball feature but um, you can do all of those tests, and uh, same thing with uh, the uh, transmit tester if you have a modulator. I've used this thing to characterize things like this little voltage controlled crystal oscillator module here. Um, that's reasonably well framed. Uh, it's um, just a little VCXO. I've got a tuning knob here, that, that was for testing the linearity, but you can also just hook it up, check the control voltage in there, hook that to the RF input, tells you the RF power of the fundamental, tells you the linearity bandwidth, all of that stuff when used as a modulator. Uh, we might be coming back to that crystal uh, in a later video, because it's got some interesting applications and I have a lot of, like, a lot of them. About 700 last I checked. Um, yeah, uh, that was basically it for now for the testing. So I think next up we'll be seeing the um, some of the boards that are inside. Uh, just taking a quick look at the construction because it is very nicely constructed. It, this thing was expensive back in the day, and a fully calibrated one still goes for like three or four thousand euros. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I bought this one uh, very cheaply and it was uh, defective. But it took me a long time to figure out what was defective and once I was able to narrow it down, it was a dead easy fix. Though these are known for capacitor plague. Uh, this one is a 1998 model, so it's just about 20 years old. And uh, it didn't really have bad caps, but I have recapped it, except the power supply, because that is uh, pretty annoying to disassemble. Uh, so uh, next up you should be seeing the um, teardown light. I'm not going to tear down any of the RF modules because those have like a million screws on them. While we're here I can mention the power input is a bit unusual before we get into the, the goodness. Uh, you'll notice here's the mains voltage input, it's dual voltage, automatic changeover, pulls around 90 watts. There's a fan on the bottom. And uh, right here is a somewhat unusual connector, but it's um, DC power input. And uh, this will do uh, 10 to 32 volts DC input. Now, um, in addition to that, there's also room inside for a lead acid battery pack that will give you about one hour's run time and 14 hour charge time. So it's a great deal. Uh, you can also, if you, by selecting the appropriate position in the front panel, you can actually have it act like a DC UPS. So if you lose mains power during a measurement, it'll just keep going. Uh, there's also a, a user port back here, which has uh, channel select ports. You can also toggle them manually if you want to, or uh, there's, with the right options, you can run a scripting language on here for automated testing. But you have a bunch of TTL 5 volt data, and there's one input, which I think is meant for uh, squelch. The, uh, the squelch output from a receiver could be plugged in here. And there's four relays plus 5 and plus minus 15 available. Uh, these are for options. Here's a serial printer keyboard interface. There's two different ones you can plug on here. 
and this is for a uh, 10 megahertz uh, reference input. So you just pop it off, you'll notice there's EMI gasketing. Uh, that uh, continues throughout the design. Now, we're not going to be taking a look inside the RF modules because those involve taking out about one million screws. Uh, there's also a bit of cabling here. But uh, general layout, before we start tearing into it, this is the power supply and battery. Battery is, I think, on the top here. Uh, if you undo all the screws top and bottom plus a couple on the side you can uh, you can just pull that out and it also uses uh, like rack style connectors there's even a little pull handle here uh, yeah it says here battery I believe that's possibly on the bottom then uh, it has built-in battery charging as well uh, but we have computer board um, data module, modulation generator and DTMF module, and DMOD meter. And this here is just a filter board. You see it has EMI gasketing along here. And uh, this has uh, filters for every line that goes over to this flat cable here. And that's the data bus that controls the um, the uh, RF synthesizers and measurement sequencing as well as the analog interfaces. The output from, from these modules here is a 455 kilohertz, uh, 450 kilohertz I have. But we'll, we'll start here and I need to use two hands to pull these out. Um, this is the DMOD meter circuit and you should have an overlay of the um, block diagram right about now. Um, this has a lot of analog circuitry. There's a 64 pin DIN 41612 connector, standard for Euro cards. You'll notice it is a bit bigger than a Euro card. Uh, Euro cards just about the same size as this connector here. Uh, it also has grounding strips top and bottom and if you Look in there, it has copper uh, fingers to grab that. But this board gets the IF input uh, on the plug back here, and there's some um, uh, there's uh, down conversion that can be done. Or, no, not uh, not down conversion, uh, but uh, it has AM detectors, face mod detectors, self check generator down here. Um, and uh, secret filtering and stuff like that along the top here. There's some switched capacitor filters that are fed from the CPU board. Over here is the FM discriminator and a little uh, gate array device there to decode the filter changer that's in here to choose what IF filtering you want. Is it the actual discriminator IC and I believe this circuitry around here is involved in the AM detection and power metering circuitry. Uh, I had one fault on this board and that was sort of in this region here. There was one resistor that didn't have enough solder put on it. So I had to, uh, so it took me forever to figure out which one it was or that that was the problem. Once I did, of course, I fixed it in like a minute and the unit has been pretty stable since then. Uh, Construction-wise, I believe this is a two-layer board, um, possibly. Um, One-sided loadout that's um, done for all the low-frequency cards in this device. Uh, this board is the one that's most likely to be listed as having a fault if there's a self-check failure, simply because this board uh, has basically every sing uh, signal in the device going through it. Uh, I'll pull the modulation generator out. Notice more commitment to EMC here. See, this board has the uh, two uh, tone generators. This here is the DTMF module, which has a decoder and an encoder. 
and um, so this is done in hardware devices which is why you can't really um, it's not as uh, detailed as the five tone stuff which I believe is done in the skate array here um, these ICs along here are bus interfaces and uh, you have the user port here with the relays and uh, filtering stuff like that protection it's all very good um, down here is some various op amps. Uh, these PLCC devices here are resistive DACs and they are basically used as volume controls. There's also a factory bodge down here. I've replaced the original uh, electrolytic with a ceramic equivalent capacitor. Uh, these modulation generators can only do sine waves and uh, I believe this right here is the sine lookup ROM. So this IC here to generate a sign, it steps through the contents of this ROM here, feeds it to the relevant DAC and then controls the volume, uses the, uh, the DAC's resistive nature to um, adjust the um, volume. And I think there's also some range switching going on here to get the wide dynamic range because these are 8-bit resistive DACs. Uh, construction quality is quite good, soldering quality is quite good, except one or two issues. Same sort of deal, I'm pretty sure this is two layer. And you'll also notice there's keying on the plug back here, so this port only goes in one location. Let's see. Plug that back in. Next up is the data module. This is the option board. I've dumped most of the ROMs on here, which is why some of the labels are a bit uh, are coming loose partly, but you have two 6803 CPUs um, and basically this is a doubled up board. Uh, I forget what this chip here, it's a Cypress one, actually does. Uh, you have some basic ROMs built in here and I'm, I believe you can um, you can load up software over the data bus for these processors here to handle uh, your protocol, uh, whatever protocol you want to use. And uh, there's also some RDAX down here, and I believe that is the same sign lookup ROM that we had earlier. Uh, there's also, I think some of these are gate arrays and a bit of analog interfacing, but. Um, this board as is without any option card doesn't actually do all that much. Uh, different layout on this one, it's more classic. You can definitely see that it's a two layer board. Um, this is obviously the analog section because it actually has a ground plane underneath it. Well, sort of ground plane underneath it. And I'm just going to put that there because the CPU board is um, kind of tough to get out. Let's see, this board is um, a pretty nice uh, single board computer. It is custom for this device, obviously, uh, but uh, by itself, it's actually a pretty fancy device. There we go. So. What we have on here is actually a lot of stuff, and uh, I think I'll overlay the um, block diagram on here as well. Uh, we have the main 68,000 microcontroller here, that runs at 8 megahertz. Uh, we have the main ADC, that's a single channel ADC, that's uh, the one that digitizes the, the, the um, received data for uh, analysis. Up here there's some ROMs, some RAM. I believe this might be a 16 by 16 hardware multiplier add-on. Making this a, a very high-end 68,000 single board computer because um, the service manual lists this as being used for, um, for DSP functions. So this is actually a 68,000 DSP board a couple of uh, programmable devices on here as well. 
uh, down here there's a Scilog chip and that's actually responsible for um, for graphics that's basically a graphics processing unit though not uh, what you might think of as a GPU today it basically implements all the functions uh, that a normal C library or a normal graphics library for 2D work would typically implement what this chip does in hardware. It has its own display memory as well. It's a, it's a pretty cool addition to it. Um, and uh, you'll notice uh, on the display that it's, um, it's all monochrome and made with, uh, you know, basically straight lines going between stuff. But that's all rendered on this uh, Scilog uh, GPU. There's a battery here that amazingly still works. Um, this is a uh, 2.4 volt nickel uh, cadmium, I think, battery. Um, I haven't bothered to replace it because it actually holds a charge reasonably well. Um, it's uh, also not really an issue if this runs flat because it's um, the uh, software is smart enough to initialize a, uh, a garbage or, or blank memory. And there's also various other chips on here that I don't really know too much about. Uh, I think this is a four layer board actually. It looks like it has a ground plane built in. Um, this, this little board here is pretty cool. One of the reasons I like this thing is because it does use a pretty cool old processor and um, and it's very nicely built. You know, if you have a Eurocard extender, it's not really an issue to measure on these. And I did do that a fair bit when I got it and was debugging. Uh, I'll walk you through what's in each of these three RF modules here. Uh, the one on the end here is what's called the RF module. And that, that actually directly connects to the front panel RF ports. It has uh, the attenuators, the uh, first converters, the switching stuff, uh, various local oscillators and, um, and uh, mixers, frequency counter for the auto frequency detect. All that stuff's done on the main board. It also has an adjustment here that's for the uh, 20 megahertz internal time base. And that time base is used throughout the system. It's divided down to 800 kilohertz and used for the CPU board, for example, and uh, pretty much everything that, that runs uh, in this thing is uh, synchronized in some way to the, um, to the uh, main uh, time base here, making it a fairly accurate instrument. Uh, there's also loads of self-check paths built into the uh, circuitry, including in the front end here, so, you can, uh, so it can self-check very thoroughly. Uh, next to it here is the um, the local oscillator board, uh, which has a uh, very complicated PLL to generate the very fine uh, frequency steps for the entire operating range. Uh, tons of dividers. It also has the modulation circuitry built in for um, for doing FM, for example. Uh, I believe the AM modulation is done here and AM detection is on the D-mod meter but the, the modulator is here and that's a weird design in, its, in itself. And this here is the option card for duplex analysis. This basically contains a, um, an extra PLL that's um, the subset of the features included in the main one that's, uh, that's then slaved to, the, um, to this one by this cable here and I, this is the output from it. Um, these are all MCX connectors. So th this, these are the only plugs on this, except this one, which has some connections in the front. But uh, you, to get this one out, you have to undo, I think two screws and you can pull it out. And uh, with the other ones, you just have to undo the connectors and you're done. So, very simple uh, design uh, to uh, to work on. The only annoying part really is if you're trying to um, to extend these to 
check them while they're working. This this data this database here doesn't really handle uh, long cable lengths all that well.